Good morning. My name is Jorge Sogaron. I am a professor at the University of Kansas and I would be teaching part of this course, the part that is related to transfer from science and knowledge to policy. Uh, I am very sorry that I won't be able to be with you personally. Uh, I would really like to be there partly because I like the, the city of Cape Town a lot, partly because there is no substitute to the one-to-one -one interaction. However, I can't, so uh, this is the second best thing. I will be uh, sending uh, or giving town a group of um, a set of uh, uh, videos like this one, and I hope I will do my best to transmit through video, which is um, a, a medium I am not really familiar with. Uh, my ideas and my experiences about uh, science to knowledge in the, uh, I mean, science to policy in the world of biodiversity. Um, I will, I will divide my talks in several um, uh, sub presentations. First one is about <coughs> uh, what is the meaning of biodiversity in the world of policy. Biodiversity knows not as something that affects the livelihoods of, say, farmers or ranchers or villagers, or something that is of the interest of scientists, but biodiversity as it's related to actions of government or decision uh, taking at many levels. Uh, biodiversity is uh, biodiversity governance takes place at different levels and therefore you need to uh, be specific about at what level you are talking about. So first thing I'm going to talk about what is biodiversity in the sense of uh, in the context of, pol of policy. Second thing I will be presenting uh, um, a similar discussion on what is what is policy, what I mean by policy. When we talk about moving from knowledge to policy, what's the meaning of policy? Uh, again, in a context of biodiversity. Uh, then I am going to talk about um, uh, instances, examples of, of uh, this uh, this. Uh, transfer this conveyor belt between the knowledge and the and the, and the policy making, the decision taking, and finally, I will be quoting from examples, specific examples from Conavio. Conavio is uh, the institution I used to work for for many years, 13 years. It's a government agency, federal government agency in Mexico, and I will be presenting a few examples of. What I be this well, what I will be describing, but over uh, in a, in real cases in Mexico. So, having said that, I will begin uh, speaking about policy and uh, biodiversity. We all know that biodiversity is a very complicated object or a very complicated set of, uh, of phenomena. Uh, biodiversity includes uh, the, the uh, ecosystems, uh, the landscapes and their functioning, how they are structured, how they function, how they are placed in the planet. Biodiversity includes also the species that um, um, constitute those ecosystems and of course biodiversity also includes the genetic processes, the molecular processes that take place inside the species. So this entire wide um, set of phenomena is what constitutes biodiversity. There is a huge amount of knowledge about uh, biodiversity. Also, there is a huge amount of ignorance. It's probably much more ignorance than knowledge. But we shouldn't um, uh, commit the, the, the error of disregarding all the, the knowledge that is available. This knowledge is uh, in the form of uh, what the scientists have been studying for centuries now and it's it's accumulated in the papers, in the journals, in the books, in the databases. But it's also accumulated in the form of the knowledge that uh, uh, different local people have about their, their own environments and that is a very substantial and very valuable uh, set of knowledge. And it's also accumulating nowadays in what is called citizen science. 
which is a different kind of uh, uh, information and data about different components or aspects of biodiversity. So um, all this knowledge we would like to transfer into decision making in ways of uh, um, affecting the way that decisions are taken. In order to, that's what we will be talking about during the, the seminar, but uh, first what I need is to, to go over the, um, uh, the major issues that, that biodiversity in, um, relates with policy. And those major issues are, in the first place, what is called conservation. Conservation, plain conservation. Conservation is simply that we don't want certain species to disappear or certain populations to disappear. We want them healthy, we want them uh, um, keeping their capacity to evolve. Uh, and the same applies to, to landscapes and to ecosystems, including their functioning. So, uh, biodiversity is uh, biodiversity conservation is related to maintaining certain structures and certain uh, components and certain processes uh, of life on Earth well and working properly. Uh, this is done first by concentrating. This is traditional. Traditionally, people have concentrated first on species. Uh, we we first need to have good um, uh, records of what species are present in a particular spot. We need to know uh, what are their population sizes, are they fluctuating, are they not, are they uh, healthy, and so on. This right now is done mostly for birds, mammals, reptiles, and amphibians, and some species of plants. Uh, very seldom for insects, more than a few species of butterflies or damselflies sometimes, and never for the most obscure, the more obscure things like mites, nematodes, many of the smaller invertebrates, small uh, bugs, certainly not for microbes. And that's a pity because probably those little things uh, are the ones that in a certain deep sense, run the world. But we don't know much about them, so we will uh, we can't uh, talk much about them either. So the, that's the first thing. The second thing is uh, conservation of places. For that, we need to, uh, to have an idea of how valuable they are from any perspective, and the perspectives about value may change tremendously. Some people care about a place because it's beautiful, for a spiritual value only, and that may be even a religious value. Of, very often, it's not, not uncommon at all, as you may uh, well know. Um, there are also places that are very important because of the, the ecosystem services they provide water catchments, areas of protection uh, against um, tsunamis, say, things like that. Uh, they are areas that are important because they are the places where certain useful species come to breed, for instance, mangroves and many others. So you need to have an idea to, uh, of what places exist, what, what combinations, what landscapes, what ecosystems, how well are they maintained, and somehow how valuable they are. The valuable, I repeat, depends, it's in the eye of the beholder. It's not the same value if you are a community that holds a, 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 a forest grove as a holly because your ancestors have been doing it forever, or because you are a scientist and you are interested in species that, uh, that are rare and just occur there. Completely different reasons. So, value is an, an exercise in itself in policy uh, making. And those, uh, th this is the first, the first set of, of, of um, activities or, or this, the first aspect or the first point of view about biodiversity that is related to policy conservation. Okay, so uh, one thing is conservation for the sake of conservation. 
species for whatever um, non-economical or non-use reasons we may have. The second, second area is conservation when we are focusing on species for reasons of, 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 of use from anthropocentric reasons because we need to conserve certain species because we want to for reasons of use or value, economic value. And the best example of this is, is uh, medicinal plants. Medicinal plants um, have been used forever in, in by human uh, the human species. Even even there are many animals that use medicinal plants. They know the values of certain uh, things that they chew. Um, so it's been uh, reported for chimpanzees, for instance. But uh, there are many other animals that also are capable of, of uh, getting to know that certain species of, of plants uh, are useful when you're not feeling very well. Uh, so medicinal plants um, can and um, need to be properly managed. And to do that, we need, as for the others, we need knowledge. Um, the thing with medicinal plants, what makes it very complicated, is that very often there is a substantial amount of knowledge in the form of traditional knowledge. Uh, traditional knowledge uh, can go back thousands of years, and in many cases it has been documented very detailed for instance, in the in the in the Vedas of India, uh, in China, there are very substantial bodies of knowledge about medicinal plants, which are also um, compiled and documented in in, in written form. Uh, the same applies to several of the Mesoamerican uh, uh, nations. Uh, for instance, uh, the the Aztecs, uh, the the Spaniards, when they conquered Mexico, they compiled. A large number of um, documents on the, the um, knowledge of the Aztecs about uh, their own medicine, and surprisingly enough, that was used for centuries into uh, until very recently, until the 19th century. Most of the Mexican pharmacopoeia was based on the Indian pharmacopoeia of the time. So. Um, this is the second uh, area where we need to know things in order to manage properly. We need to know the sizes of the populations. Of course, we need to know which ones are medicinal. Uh, we need to know uh, how well they are doing. We need to know how to get the right extract. Sometimes it is hugely complicated uh, to a degree that makes you wonder how on earth um, the, the traditional peoples that developed these medicines were capable of finding such complicated sets of, of um, mixtures and, and, and procedures to extract the right principles from the right part of the plant, sometimes at the right uh, time of the month or season of the year. It's very, very complicated. So we need to know the whereabouts, the parts, the substances that are inside, uh, the population dynamics, how to, to extract them. That used to be the case until very recently. Nowadays, you can get the genes, and and that is uh, that adds a lot of complication because now with the genes, uh, you don't have to to produce the, the plant in large quantities the way it used to be in the past. For instance, for quinoa that you have, I mean, for quinina, quinine that you have to extract the bark from the tree, so you have the you have to have the plantations of the trees. Nowadays, that can be done, not always, but very often, just with a gene sequence, and that opens a very, very, very horrible can of worms, which is called biopiracy. Um, so. Governments and, and citizens and communities need to know very good information about, um, about uh, their medicinal plants in order to be able to take good decisions about um, how um, to manage them, whether to ex allow export things or not, to whom, uh, under what circumstances, and that is a very complicated problem.
besides medicinal plants, another very obvious um, group of, um, of species that um, require management and decision by governments and by users and by uh, local groups is forestry. Uh, many countries have still large uh, uh, forest uh, in their in their in their uh, in the land of the state. Uh, there are there are tropical rainforests. There are tropical dry forests. There are temperate forests. There are uh, all kinds of forests in most ecosystems of the world. Some of them really very very extensive. Most of them are one way or another on the sites of companies that want to extract the timber, uh, and this is. Uh, Oh, this can be a very um, corrupt business with uh, payoffs going over there for the permits and things like that. Unfortunately, many times decisions are taken not even considering the scientific facts of how to manage properly a forest. A forest can be managed properly, even tropical rainforests can be managed properly. Um, there are textbook examples of uh, how to do uh, the proper management, the, the sustainable management of a, a tropical rainforest in Peru, in Ecuador, in Mexico, in Belize, in many parts of the world, in Africa as well, in India. Um, and uh, this is one of the most uh, really most important uh, areas where if there is knowledge and the knowledge can inform policy and policy do not get distorted by by uh, corruption or other um, or other or poor governance or lack of institutional capacity or whatever if if the if the knowledge is available and the good decisions are are made on the basis of that knowledge then forests forestry is one of the most uh, successfully proven ways of managing biodiversity in a good way, in a sustainable way, at the same time providing benefits locally and also nationally. Um, some of the best examples, as I mentioned, are in, 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 in Latin America, the best examples I know of. Uh, there are also very good examples in Western Africa. And the trick here is to be able to to not only to to have the information available and in ways that can be uh, understood and managed by the decision makers but also um, by um, the society as a whole and the locals the locals are decision makers too and some of the of the most interesting cases that I know of uh, of how um, biodiversity knowledge uh, is translated into into uh, into policy making. Uh, they involve directly the communities that own the forest. I will talk about this later in one of the uh, talks about the the examples. So forestry is another uh, very um, <coughs> clear area where knowledge of the species, knowledge of the ecosystems, knowledge of their functioning, the interactions, the population sizes, the, 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 the fluctuations, the interactions, the genetics uh, is required in order to do uh, an intelligent an intelligent management of that resource uh, which is constituted by biodiversity. 